Well, well, well. I'm back. Did you miss my lectures? Hmm. I bet you did. Um, but this one's a little bit different. It's not really about history. Uh, we are now in our financial literacy unit. This is something that I've done uh, every year after the AP exam. Uh, this year, obviously, we will be uh, a little bit different. We can't do everything I used to do, um, but we'll try to do the the important things. Um, and so just a little bit of background, uh, why I think this is important. So um, when I got my fancy big, big boy job as a teacher, um, I was, you know, you go into these orientation meetings and they give you all this, you know, paperwork about your retirement accounts and all this stuff. And um, they they tell you to sign up for all this stuff or it's important to do this, but they don't really explain it. They don't really do a good job of teaching you uh, about all this stuff, the investing, the saving, uh, and all that stuff. And uh, I really... Uh, you know, thought it was important that I should, you know, educate myself on all this stuff so that I'm uh, making the best decisions. And so uh, that's what I did. You know, uh, 10 or 12 years ago, I started really researching a lot of this stuff. And uh, I've learned a lot of, of important things. And uh, what I will be doing is, is passing along um, a lot of the stuff that I've learned. And so kind of the model, at least that I did in the classroom, uh, was um, I, I came up with nine rules, my, uh, my financial rules. I have nine of them. And I think that if you follow these nine, you will be awesome. You will be millionaires and you will be better off than uh, most of the people in the country. And so I, I came up with this idea for the nine rules, uh, actually from uh, an article I read uh, from NPR, National Public Radio, my favorite radio station, um, where this, uh, I believe he was a, he's an economist or something, but uh, he was having a conversation with a friend or something like that. And uh, he basically said that he, that all the stuff that you need to know about, about money can be written on one index card. That it's not, um, you know, super complicated. And so he he took out an index card and he wrote down his rules. Uh, and then later on, they actually published a book about the index card, which in a way sort of defeats the purpose of the index card because you wrote a whole book about it. But um, and so I put the index. You can see the index card, which. Um, uh, I have my own rules. You can look at his rules, which are good. Um, but I came up with my own rules. So my hope is that you will grab an index card. And usually in class, I gave every student an index card. And each day we would add one or two rules to this in index card. And so you will have my rules um, on this index card. And, um, you know, and, and, I know that a lot of people are like, ah, oh, this stuff, you know, uh, you know, I don't really care about this stuff right now, but maybe down the road when you get your, you know, kind of your first, your career job and you have to make these decisions that maybe you'll, uh, break your card out and be like, oh, maybe Mr. Homburg uh, was right. And so I would highly encourage you maybe take out an index card. We'll go through these and, uh, add the nine rules, save it somewhere. And then uh, bust it out once you graduate college and you have your, your, your big career so you can make these, um, these uh, important decisions. So let's get into the rules. We'll cover a, a couple of the rules um, in this uh, little lecture. So rule number one, and you could write, I would encourage you to write this down um, on an in index card. Uh, rule number one, save at least 20% of your income. This is after tax income, meaning after the government's taken out their income tax, 
Social Security tax, Medicare, all that stuff will be taken out of your check. After that's taken out, whatever you have left, save 20% of that. At least 20%. Strive for more. Uh, obviously, you want to save as much as possible. Uh, most, you know, gonna, you know, financial experts, supposed experts say, save 10 to 15%. I think that's too low. I think at least 20%. Uh, you know, my, my personal goal is 50%. Uh, we are not quite there yet. We're getting close. Uh, but 50% of your income, save that. That's, that's, um, should be a goal that you strive for. And, you know, that gets easier as you make more money, as long as you don't, um, buy more stuff. You know, usually people, when they make more money, they just buy more stuff. And so they're not actually doing better they're not saving more. They just have, you know, maybe a fancier car and a bigger house, but, uh, I don't think that stuff is as important. So that's the first rule. Save at least 20%. Um, Rule number two, very important, and we saw this, which are uh, in our in our current situation. Uh, we are seeing this in our current situation. Have an, an emergency fund uh, to cover your living expenses for three to six months. So you should save. You should have that, and it should be uh, readily available in an easy place to access, like a savings account. So you don't want to have your emergency fund like. Um, invested in stocks necessarily because um it takes a while you got to sell the stocks and then you actually have to pay taxes on that and all that stuff so if you have it in a savings account it's easy to go and take that money out um so three to six months is three to six months of living expensive and a lot of people in this uh, coronavirus situation you know they were laid off and uh, a lot of them didn't have any money saved up um, and that's not a good situation. Um, and so you want to have, now they say, you know, three to six months, you should have more if your job is maybe less stable. Maybe it's a job that is seasonal or, or you're, you know, might get laid off or something. Um, you should have more if your job's really stable. Um, three months might be okay or somewhere in between. Okay. So now, um, so if I can go back to rule number one, save 20% of your income, you're like, you know, why am I saving? Why am I saving this money? Um, and now the ultimate goal is you need to save money so you can at some point stop working. Um, unless you want to work your whole life. Uh, most people don't want to, most people can't physically do that. So you need to save money so that you can stop working at some point. Um, now you will say, well, don't I get social security? Yes, you will get social security when you're, you know, 66 or 67, who knows when it will be when you guys retire and might be 70. Social security is only meant to replace about 40% of your income. Um, so it's, it, you'll get checks about 40% of what you were making while you were working. That's not enough to really live on or to have an enjoying, uh, you know, uh, a, a good retirement where you're traveling and all that stuff. Social security is not going to be enough and who knows if it will even be around. So you need to save money so you can stop working at some point. Now, um, there's this graph here I will show you and I will have a a link to this article in Blackboard, and you can read the whole thing. Um, and this shows on the left is your savings rate, the percentage. That it's all about savings, okay? How much you are saving as a percentage of your income, and then it shows uh, how many years you will have you will have to work. So, for instance, if you go to the twenty percent, which is the bare minimum that I recommend, if you save twenty percent of your income you will need to work 37 years until you can retire. So say for instance, you get your big fancy job when you're 22, you start saving 20% of your income, you will need to work 37 years, so you will be 59 and you can retire. Um, usually the retirement age is like 65, so that's a, a nice kind of early retirement. 
hopefully you're still healthy and can enjoy it. Um, now, if you are 22 and you save 40% of your income, uh, well, then you only need to work 22 years. So you could retire at 44. Um, or you can keep working if you want, but you will have enough money uh, to retire. You will be financially independent. Now, if you save 50%, again, that's that's kind of my ultimate goal. Uh, if you started that when you're 22, you only have to work 17 years. So you will be 39 um, and you can retire. So uh, again, now, if you save uh, 0% of your money, uh, as a lot of Americans do, uh, you can never retire, really. You will work probably until you're um, till you can't, till you die. Um, but, but if you only save 5% and a 5% savings rate is actually better than most of what, what most Americans are saving, you will need to work 66 years. So if you're 22 and you're only saving 5%, you'll have to work until you're 88. Not good. All right. So that's why it's important. That's why we save money and it's better to start early. And we'll talk about that later. So Rules one and two, we got those. You're like, all right, I'm going to save my money. But what does that mean, saving my money? Where do I do it? What What do I do? And that was my biggest question um, when I got my my big time job as a teacher, teaching you all. What do I? Where do I save it? What do I do? All right, that brings us to rule number three. You need to invest your money talk about this. This will be kind of the next section here. And I recommend well diversified index funds. And I'll explain what an index fund is for the long term. I, I use the company Vanguard. Um, there's a bunch of different uh, one, you know, JP Morgan, Chase, what Chase Bank, Goldman Sachs, I don't know, there's all these different fidelity investments there's all you've probably seen commercials there's all these different companies i myself like vanguard for various reasons that's too long to explain um and i even recommended some some funds there uh vts mx uh, now that's something you can buy you can go you can sign up for a vanguard account and you can buy that and i'll explain exactly what that is here in a minute now, and a big thing about investing is it's boring and it should be. I'll explain why. So that's rule number three. Hopefully you write that on your index card. You are ready to go. So let's talk about investing. Okay. And why first you should invest. You should invest so you don't have to work your whole life unless you want to. And that's perfect, perfectly fine. If you want to work your whole life, um, you like your job. Uh, that's fine, but uh, you should at least have enough money where you don't have to work the rest of your life. So to make money, you can do it by working or you can do it by having your assets. That's uh, essentially the money you make from working. You can invest some of that and have it work for you. So you could actually make money while you're sleeping. So, you know, I go to bed. I wake up, I check the stock market, I'm like, boom, I just made 500 bucks. I didn't even have to do anything. Um, keeping money in your back pocket means the money's not working for you. And actually you, you are losing money over time. Okay, because of that last bullet. If you do not beat inflation, we've talked about inflation in class. It's essentially where your money is not worth as much. You don't have as much purchasing power. You see, you know, a candy bar in the 1950s was a nickel, a candy bar. Now, man, candy bars are like over a dollar. I thought they were like a dollar. Now I'm looking at, they're like sometimes $2. It's crazy. That's inflation. Okay. Uh, prices go up, but also you make more money. Like when I was in high school, minimum wage was like $7 something. Now it's like, I don't know, $13, $14, whatever. Um, so it's about the same, you know, you have the same purchasing power. But if you have all of your, your 20% that you're saving and you put it in your savings account at STCU, um, that's not good. You will be losing money over time because they give you a little bit of interest 
So they actually pay you to keep your money there, but it's very low. It's under 1%. It's like 0.1%. It's crazy low. It's not, you know, it's nothing. And so over time, your savings account is losing money because of inflation. You aren't beating inflation. Inflation is usually 2 to 3% per year. So every 50 years, prices double. Of course, you're also making more money, but that, that, that money that you keep, you know, under your mattress, not a good idea. You put a thousand dollars under your mattress 30 years later, you're still going to have a thousand dollars, but you're not going to be able to buy as much with that thousand dollars. Okay. A dollar today will be worth 60 cents in 20 years as far as purchasing power. So we only use savings accounts like at STCU where I go to cover emergencies. So that's your three to six months uh, uh, emergency fund. A savings account is a perfect place to put it. Yes, we're not beating inflation. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're losing a little bit of money, but that's for an emergency, you know? And, and so, um, and you will have emergencies. Your car will break down. You'll lose your job because of the coronavirus, whatever it may be, okay? Um, but also savings accounts are good for short-term spending goals. You know, like if you want to buy something, you know, in under three years, like you're going to buy a new car, you're going to save up a couple of years. Well, putting it in your savings account is fine because you don't really have to worry too much about inflation in, you know, two to three year span. Okay. So we, we, uh, we put our money in savings accounts, uh, stuff that we may need, you know, uh, in a year or two or three or whatever. Okay. So our other money, we need to invest it because we want to beat inflation. So we're going to talk about investing here and, and mainly we're, we're going to talk about, you know, probably the most common investment, which is in the stock market. There's other investments. People invest in real estate, buying houses, flipping houses, renting out houses. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. That's uh, um, a whole other topic. Um, but we're going to talk about, you know, stocks because usually your retirement accounts that you get from your job um, will be invested in the stock market. And so it's really common. So investing makes money two ways by paying out income, which are called dividends. So if you invest in the stock market where you actually own a share, a piece of a company, they will pay you, um, when they get their profits, you know, like Apple, they make a profit from selling iPhones, etc. They will pay you a share of that profit. That's called a dividend. Uh, so that's one way you make money. Usually companies uh, give those out quarterly. Um, but also you make money because the stock increases in value. And it's just like any other product that when the, when the demand is high for a product, the price goes up. And so when demand for Apple, people are like, man, that, that's a good company. And they're making lots of good stuff. The, the price of their stock will go up. So if you bought Apple in the 19, you know, early 1990s or whatever, uh, when it wasn't in demand and you held on to it, you would have made a lot of money uh, if you sold it today. So, but people are like, isn't the stock market risky? Um, it can be, but it all, also can be very safe to, to, depending on, on what you buy. And I'll explain exactly what. I recommend buying, but let's look at a graph here, the history of the stock market. Okay. And this was a question on that, on that financial literacy quiz. Since the early 1900s, stock market has averaged 10.4% a year. That includes the stock market crash in 1929. Okay. If you take that out, it's even higher. So if you would have invested a thousand dollars, which was a lot of money in 1900, but if you would have had invested a thousand dollars and done nothing, let it sit, or, or if your great grandparents would have done this for you, uh, you would have almost $20 million by 1999. And that would be probably even double or triple that, that number now because stocks are a lot higher than they were in 1999. So, uh, over the long term, the stock market is a safe investment. That's why we, we buy stocks and we hold them for the long term. 
If you're trying to do the short game where you're trying to make money in a couple weeks, you're going to buy a stock and you and you hope it goes up in a in a week or a month. That's that's not what that's not what I recommend and and you could lose lots of money. Okay? So you look at 1929 there, if you would have bought, you know, a bunch of stocks on in one day thinking that they'd go up and you know, it went way down. But uh, what I recommend is called dollar cost averaging where you buy stocks, uh, you know, every two weeks when you get paid or every month, I get paid every month. So I buy some every month. I buy a little bit. I don't try to time the market. Uh, you're never going to win that way in the long term. Uh, even the pros struggle at that. So we buy a little bit every month, every two weeks, and we hold on to it. And over time, over the long term, because we, we're starting this in our 20s and we're going to, you know, sell that stuff in our 50s or 40s, whenever you're retiring 60s and then you sell it um, and you could live off that money forever so types of stocks um, these are kind of the most common you can buy an individual stock it's known as a security you can buy a share of Apple um, again buying individual stocks um, I don't recommend because they're more volatile um, yes they may go up a lot, but they also may go down a lot. It's more of a roller coaster. And I'm, I don't like roller coasters. I like just chill, steady, being on the ground. I don't like being up in the air. Anyways, so then what we have are uh, groups of stocks. Okay. And so the next mutual funds and index funds and ETFs are all groups of stocks. So a mutual fund, or a, a technically an actively managed mutual fund, is a group of stocks picked by someone. This is a supposedly a professional. These are people in Manhattan, you know, in the big skyscrapers, and they pick a bunch of stocks. They may choose a hundred different companies, and it's a it's a fund. It's a big bowl of companies, and you can own that bowl, and that's safer because it's less volatile. If you own a hundred companies and there's one that's going down a whole bunch, well, you have 99 other ones that may be going up. And so it all, you know, hopefully evens out and makes, makes the, the roller, co roller coaster less crazy. Okay. And which is what I want. The only thing is that person that picks those stocks, they want to get paid too. And so they, you have to pay a percentage to that person. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Then we have index funds. These are also, uh, it's a group of stocks. Now they're not hand picked by anyone. That means the fees are lower. Um, the most famous one and uh, one that I really like is the S and P 500. You may have heard that S and P 500 or, or the Dow Jones or something like that. Those are, those are all indices. Um, they're various indexes. Um, and so the S&P 500 is the top 500 companies in America. I'll show you the, the list. Here's the top 15. I couldn't fit the top 500 in one screen. Um, but the top 500 companies in America. And they're all weighted. Okay, so number one is Microsoft right now. Um, Apple and Microsoft kind of switch uh, places sometimes. Um, so Microsoft is, is, uh, the largest company in America right now. And so they are number one in the S and P 500. So if you, you can buy an index fund and own essentially a sliver of all 500 companies. So you will buy one fund and you will own a little bit of all 500 companies in America. They're all American companies. Okay. And there's international index funds. You can do all this stuff, but we're just keeping American here. So you can buy all 500 and you own all 500 companies, a little bit of them. Um, but you own more of the number one company than the number 500 company. So it's weighted. So 5.49, you see that weight column, about five and a half percent of the S&P 500 is Microsoft. Uh, and then Apple's, you know, almost there a little over five percent and then you can see you know amazon and facebook and then alphabet which is google and so on 
Okay. And so you own these companies. And it's been a pretty safe bet over time to own these American companies. These are companies that uh, traditionally have done really well. And so we're not, we're not buying these kind of crazy penny stocks. These, oh, my, my brother told me about this company and blah, blah, blah. And they're going to be awesome and their stock's going to go way up. No, I don't listen to that. I, it's boring. I buy boring stuff and that's uh, a safer way to do it. Okay. We, I don't want to be on this crazy roller coaster. So an S&P 500 index stock, you own a sliver of all these companies. You set it and forget it. You can buy this S&P 500 index fund. Um, every two weeks that I have it on auto takes it out of my check. Boom. I buy it. I don't even pay attention to it. Don't even look at the stock market usually, uh, unless it gets real crazy. Okay. And then uh, back to our types of investments, we have ETFs, which are essentially index funds, a different type. We don't really, you could Google the difference there, but it's, we can't, we don't need to get too technical. And then there's bonds. Okay. A bond is, uh, essentially you're loaning money. So government sells bonds. That's, that's government debt. Uh, the most famous one is a, is a, a 10 year T note, the treasury note. And so if you want to, you can loan the government money, the federal government. Okay. Um, you can loan them money for 10 years and they will pay you a little bit of interest. It's very low. It's like, I don't know, one to 2% uh, interest. So maybe keeping up with inflation, maybe not. Um, and they will pay you back in 10 years or they have 20 year bonds or 30 year bonds. Um, but this is safe mainly because it doesn't go down. Stocks can go up and down. Bonds usually just go up, but they go up very slowly. And so sometimes it's nice as you get older and about ready to retire that you shift money into bonds. You're not going to make as much, but it's less volatile than stocks. And you can buy municipal bonds. These are cities like Spokane. If Spokane wants to, I don't know, build a bridge or something, uh, they may sell a bond and you can buy that. Or WSU, if they want to add to their campus, they may sell a bond and you can loan them money and they'll, they'll pay you back later. So, so the federal government, this is why we're in debt. This is why we're trillions and trillions of dollars in, in debt. And uh, China, China owns a lot of our bonds. Okay. So... So you're probably thinking, Mr. Homburg, where do you invest in? Oh, I'm showing you my investments right now. Again, it's boring. It's easy. It's the way I like it. I invest in index funds. So this is a group of stocks, um, not an actively managed mutual fund because the uh, expenses are too high. And the one I buy is called the total stock market, VTI. Um, and you can look at that, that up. There's another one that the Vanguard S and P 500 one is called VU V O O. And you can buy that as well. And all these different companies have their own version. So if you go to fidelity, you'll have the fidelity and they're all essentially the same. So the total U S stock market, that's what I buy. Uh, usually in one of my accounts, I buy the S and P 500 one, but they're very similar. The S and P 500 versus the total stock market is I don't know, 97% similar. Um, so in the total stock market, there's like 4,000 companies, whereas the S&P 500, there's 500. But in the total stock market, you also have those 500 in there. And it, like the S&P 500, they're weighted. So the top, you know, one company, Microsoft, is, is more heavily weighted than the 3,567th company or whatever. And so there's a huge match between the total stock market and the S&P 500. Um, and the, the returns, historical returns are, are almost identical. So you can choose either one. In one of my accounts, I don't have the option of choosing this. I have, they, don't, they had an S&P 500 version, so I chose that one. That's, that's my state retirement. And those, that's a little more limited. So why do I do this? First, it's boring, it's easy. Um, but fees, this is what will destroy you. And this is what most people don't look at. They don't understand. They get confused. Even people I work with, family members, they say, yeah, I don't know what, what to choose. Um, so I have a financial advisor um, and I pay him. But it's easy because he only takes 1%. I just pay him 1% and 
and he tells me what to do with all my money, and I don't even have to think about it. People say that all the time, and I'm like, wrong. All you need to do is educate yourself. Take a couple hours, and you can learn the stuff. It's not complicated. It's easy, and it's boring, as it should be. And so you need to watch your fees. When you get your fancy big-time job, and you get your retirement package, and you have to choose your investments and all this stuff, first thing I would do is look at the fees. 1% is a crazy high fee. I would never choose anything 1%. Especially 2%. No way, 2%. Okay? Even... 0.5% I would be, I probably wouldn't do that either. Um, the index fund that I choose, uh, VTI, um, is 0 0.05. That's the fee. So on $10,000, I pay $5 in a fee. Okay. Um, the average actively managed mutual fund, these are people, these are pros in Manhattan in the skyscrapers, they charge between 1% and 2%, sometimes even more. But you're like, hold on, but they're pros. And they pick better stocks than the S&P 500, right? That's why they charge more. Because they, they you know, if the S&P 500 gets, re, you know, makes 10% a year, well, and I can pay this mutual fund guy, you know, 2%, but if he makes me 15% a year, that seems to be pretty good, right? It's worth it. Ah, let's look at this chart here, okay? Fees, they can take your money, okay? So you see no fees in red, a 1% fee in, I don't know what color that is, purple or something, and then the lighter one, 2.4%. With a 2.4% fee, it almost takes half of your money. 1% fee, you're losing out on $180,000. Okay. And so you think about it, you're like, oh, 1%, that's nothing. I'll pay my friend down the street 1% to manage my money because I'm, I'm confused. I don't know what to do. Okay. No, you're going to lose maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars. But again, you're like, well, these, these guys, um, they choose, you know, they're, they're, that's their job is to choose stocks. So aren't they better at it? Well, in the study done by the New York Times, of the 2,862 top mutual funds in America, only two of them beat the stock market five years in a row. Meaning if you took the total stock market, what I invest in VTI, and compared it to these, these, pe these pros, only two of them beat the stock market five years in a row. Zero of them beat the stock market six years in a row. So the professionals, can't even beat the stock market. So why not just buy the stock market? Okay. Yeah, they'll have good years now and then, but not worth the 2% that you're paying them. So why don't you just buy the whole stock market and ride that wave? Yeah, it goes up and down a little bit, but over the long term, you're almost guaranteed to make money. Okay. Unless the whole American system collapses. And if that happens and all businesses go out of business, um, Money's not even money will be the least of your worries. You'll be trying to stay alive, okay? Um, so you know, maybe there's a catastrophe where the you know an asteroid hits America, but uh, for the most part, you know, American companies have been doing well for the past you know 200 years and they probably will keep doing well. And so I just ride the stock market. And there was this, this story, if you've heard it, Warren Buffett, who was you know, th I don't know, third richest man in America. Um, he made a million dollar bet. That's how rich he is. He can make a million dollar bet. And he bet this hedge fund manager, this other guy, and they made a bet. I don't know. It was like a 10 year bet, I think, um, uh, to see who could make the most money in the stock market. So Warren Buffett, all he chose was an index fund. I can't remember if it was total stock market or the, or the S and P 500 one. He put a million dollars, uh, in the, in that index fund, the hedge fund guy, uh, bought and sold stocks. You know, he, he handpicked them and guess who won Warren Buffett, the boring investment. That's the best way to go. Even these fancy people that that's their job is to pick stocks. They can't even beat the stock market. So why not buy the stock market? So that's what I do. Boring, easy. Don't pay someone to do this. It's silly. Okay. So 
Rule number four, though, how much money do I need to save? Well, we know the percentage, 20% or more, but how, how do I know when I can stop working? Rule number four, you will become financially independent, or which means ready to retire, uh, when you save 25 times your annual spending, your yearly spending. Okay, so you got to figure out how much money do I need to live off of, you know, a year? You know, maybe you need $50,000 a year to live. Maybe 40000 maybe 75000 I don't know. Depends on, on kind of the, what lifestyle you want to live. But, but say you can live off of $50,000 a year. And by the time you're ready to retire, you know, your house will probably, probably be paid off. So you're not going to you know, which is your probably your your biggest expense, so you don't have to pay a mortgage or anything like that. So you can live off of fifty thousand dollars a year. Uh, so if we do our math, twenty five times fifty thousand, we need one point two five million, and we can retire. Once our retirement accounts reach that, we can quit, and we can safely we can withdraw four percent a year. Okay, that's that's the rule, and I'll put a link to this article as well in Blackboard, and you can read more about the math here. But you can withdraw four percent safely for forever, okay? Um, because if the stock market returns ten percent a year, and you take out a few percent for inflation, so maybe it, it gets seven percent after you factor in inflation. Um, well, you can withdraw safely. 4% a year. You can probably even withdraw more, 5%, 6% maybe. Uh, but 4% is really a safe number and you will never run out of money. So you can retire when you're 30 with 1.25 million, withdraw $50,000 a year from it, 4%, and you can live off it for forever. That's the math. I'll show you. It's amazing. And you will even have money to leave your kids probably. Okay. Um, all right, I keep getting interrupted, always. Um, so, our first, uh, we have four rules out of nine, I think, okay? Save 20% of your money or more. You can start doing that right now. Um, start early. I'll talk about, um, with rule number five, what specifically, where specifically do we put it? You've probably heard of those IRA, Roth, traditional IRA, 401k, all that stuff. We'll talk about that. You need to have an emergency fund. Very, very important. You start there first, okay, with that emergency fund. Um, and then uh, what was rule number three? Where am I at here? Um, oh, invest in index funds. Easy, boring. That's what you do. It beats the market. Okay, you don't even have to worry about it. It's simple. And then rule number four, you become financially independent uh, when you save 25 times the amount uh, of your spending. Okay. You can keep working after then, uh, or you can, you know, quit your job, start your own business, do whatever you want, take a year off, uh, whatever, or just stop working altogether and, uh, volunteer. Um, but once you reach 25% of your annual spending, you can quit working. See you later. <laughs>